Good morning, delegates. Welcome to Brisbane. If I could um, ask you all to um, perhaps take your seats, if you wouldn't mind. And if you're struggling to find a seat, they are basically in state and craft group and uh, special interest group um, arrangement. Um, I'm Warwick Huff, I'm the Acting um, Secretary General um, of the AMA, I'd like to welcome you here. Um, before I invite the, um, the um, officials in, I just have to acquaint you with a few emergency procedures in the hotel. Um, we are told that um, if you uh, hear the um, beep beep alert tones and uh, are followed by evacuation tones of whoop whoop, um, then you're to whoop whoop right out of the building as quickly as you can. Um, look for the nearest exit. Um, there are fire stairs at both ends of the floor. Um, and please make sure you follow any directions uh, from the staff. Obviously, um, don't use the lifts. Um, the evacuation assembly uh, is in the railway plaza at the south side of the building, which is the Edward Street side of the building. Um, if you do require assistance, um, please look for staff who can help you. Um, and once you're in the evacuation area, which I'm, I'm sure you won't uh, do that, um, or we won't have to do that, um, people will let you know when you... Um, when you need to um, uh, return to the building. So uh, thank you very much. Um, if I could now ask you to be um, upstanding um, for the arrival of the um, senior officials of the association. Welcome delegates to the 2019 AMA National Conference. Please take your seats. So I'd like first to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land and waters around which we meet today, their elders, past, present and emerging, and all other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present here today. The local traditional owner groups are the Turabal and Jagera people. If they wish to add in, it, it would look like I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land and waters around, we, around which we meet today. So may I welcome to the meeting songwoman Marucci, who will conduct a welcome to country. Yadani Australia Boo, advance Australia in strength. People of Australia, let us make a good spirit place. For we are from the ancient, we are of the past and the present, and we are all Australia's future. That is the English translation of the Australian National Anthem for which I was asked to write for the Indigenous All-Stars game. Um, in the Turbal language about five years ago. I'm talking rugby league, even although I'm an Aussie rules person, but yeah. <laughs> um, um, and um, I've since decided to put uh, that anthem um, into my Welcome to Country, just an extract. That will be followed by the Brisbane River Dreaming, and um, I shall then do the blessing of the gathering, and then I shall ex exit with a song from my birthplace, which is um, hi historically here in Queensland, one of the biggest Aboriginal communities in Australia. Um, the Aussie rules part came in when I was sent to Melbourne as a 12 year old. Mm -hmm. 
That's welcome to Brisbane in the language of that Durabal people. In accordance with the customs of the tribes of southeastern Queensland from whom we are a part of when we do the welcome to country that is done as a blessing of the gathering in the song, I shall do that in a tinchy while, but would like to firstly extend our appreciation to the organisers of this event this morning to, for asking us to be here in this capacity. Um, the Turrbal people were actually documented as being extinct or on the verge of extinction back in the 1860s and that's why a, a select committee uh, into the activities of the native police and it's just been one small family that has survived the impact of European settlement upon our ancestral homelands. We're in the process of try, trying to get our traditional rights and interests like all over the continent and processes like this, the welcome is to is, um, I suppose, is the way we are doing it. Um, and contrary to what is it might be in government um, spiels on who's the original people of Brisbane, Jackaroos, Jagara, Jackaroos, Holden Jackaroos got their name from um, the Jagaroos, the, they were the mountain people. I'm actually part of the Ningi Ningi clan, which means the lowlands, the saltwater people. So really, they're from up the river, up on the mountains. We the saltwater ones down here on the flatlands in the swamp. Um, but that's an issue we're addressing elsewhere. But I suppose we know different to others. You'll have imperialists from anywhere around the globe. So uh, that's an issue we're um, just addressing anyway. That's our problem. So I shall now sing the blessing of the gathering and thanks for having us here. And I hope everything goes well for you, your uh, conference this year.
I'd now like to welcome to the stage uh, Mr. Daryl Murphy, who will uh, sing the national anthem for us. And I'd ask you to stand for the singing of the national anthem. Good morning, everyone. Sing along if you feel the need. Strings all, let us rejoice. ask you again to stand in a moment um, as we read the Declaration of Geneva. The background to this, the Declaration of Geneva, the Physician's Oath was originally adopted by the General Assembly of the World Medical Association in Geneva in 1948 and has been amended since in 1968, 83, 94 and recently in 2017. It's a declaration of a physician's dedication to the humanitarian goals of medicine, a declaration that was especially important in, the view of, in view of the medical crimes committed by Nazi Germany. The Declaration of Geneva was intended as a revision of the Hippocratic Oath so that it, it pre presented that oath's moral truths in a more modern way. Please stand and join with me in reading the Physician's Pledge. As a member, please read with me. As a member of the medical profession, I solemnly pledge to dedicate my life to the service of humanity. The health and well being of my patient will be my first consideration. I will respect the autonomy and dignity of my patient. I will maintain the utmost respect for human life. I will not permit considerations of age, disease or disability, creed, ethnic origin, gender, nationality, political affiliation, race, sexual orientation, social standing or any other factor to intervene between my duty and my patient. I will respect the secrets that I can see even after the patient has died. I will practice my profession with conscience and dignity and in accordance with good medical practice. I will foster the honour and noble traditions of the medical profession. I will give to my teachers, colleagues and students the respect and gratitude that is their due. I will share my medical knowledge for the benefit of the patient and the advancement of health care. I will attend to my own health, well-being and abilities in order to provide care of the highest standard. I will not use my medical knowledge to violate human rights and civil liberties, even under threat. I make these promises solemnly, freely and upon my honour. Please be seated. Uh, 
Uh, so my name is Beverly Robotham. I'm the chair of Federal Council, which is the host for the AMA National Conference. It's uh, an honour for me now to introduce our president, Dr. Tony Bartoni. The president will introduce our esteemed guests, and after that, a short video will be played. Uh, welcome, President. Delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I would also like to welcome you all to National Conference, my first as, national, as Federal President. We are joined at this conference by a number of special guests. First of all, I'll introduce the past AMA presidents. I would like to acknowledge the presence of these uh, former AMA presidents at this conference and I will ask them to stand, out, stand up as I name them. Would you please welcome Dr. Bryce Phillips, President from 1988 to 1990. Dr. Bill Glasson, President from 2003 to 2005. I'm sure Bill will be here later. Dr. Makesh Hakuel, President from 2005 to 2007. Associate Professor Rosanna Capalingua, President from 2007 to 2009. <laughs> Dr. Andrew Pesce, President from 2009 to 2011. <laughs> Dr. Steve Hambleton, President from 2011 to 2014. And my immediate predecessor, Dr. Michael Gannon, President from 2016 to 2018. Good to see you back, Michael. The AMA is also pleased and honoured, as we are at every conference, to have with us some very distinguished overseas visitors. As I read your name, would you please come forward to the stage for a gift from the AMA as a token of our appreciation and your attendance. Would you please welcome from the World Medical Association, the, the President, Dr. P Professor Leonid Edelman. From the American Medical Association, we welcome AMA President, Dr. Barbara McEnany. <laughs> Dr. McEnany is a, pi a cancer p care pioneer, but almost it didn't happen. She started out heading in a career in IT until she realized that she liked people more than computers. From the Thai Medical Association, we welcome their president, Professor Ronakai Kongsakon, a psychiatrist with a particular interest in preventing domestic and family violence. Now, I know that we've had some travel itinerary difficulties, but the, from the Indian Medical Association, we are joined by both their president, Dr. Santanu Sen, and their honorary secretary general, Dr. Ra Ragakani Asakan. And, uh, and are they present at the moment? No. If we think our federal election was a long drawn out process, I'm sure that the recent Indian election with 900 million eligible voters makes our election look like a school PC election kindergarten. Thank you. And from the New Zealand Medical Association, we welcome the president, Dr. Kate Baddock, and the CEO, Leslie Clark.
Now, Kate and Leslie, according to Google Trends, there was a spike in searches for moving to New Zealand in Australia last Saturday and Sunday. And the Immigration New Zealand says that there was a more than tenfold increase in Australians looking at its website on Sunday. It's always exciting to host our friends from medical associations from around the world. Please introduce yourself to them while they're here. They are, there are so many good stories about how our profession and our associations cooperate globally and you'll be surprised at the commonality of both themes and interests and outcomes and endeavours around the world. So please do make them welcome through the weekend. Okay. Now at this point we
I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we meet on. I acknowledge their elders, past, present and emerging, and respect their continuing culture and contribution they make to the life of this city and this region. I would also like to acknowledge and welcome other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be attending this conference. It has been another very busy and productive year for your AMA. The past six weeks tells it all. We've had a five-week election campaign and all that it entails for a leading advocacy and lobbying organisation like ours. We produced our election manifesto, key health issues for the 2019 federal election. We launched our public hospital report card, which made headlines and created political headaches at the start of the campaign. We released our rural health survey. We issued around 20 media statements on health policy. I delivered a keynote speech on private health. I was on a panel at the AMSA Leadership Seminar. We witnessed an election campaign that saw the coalition government returned, much to the surprise of many of the pundits and the pollsters. And during this campaign, our hardworking secretariat has managed to put on this conference together while all that was going on. Well done, team. Fellow delegates, we have a lot of important work to finish with the presumed health minister, Greg Hunt. In the 12 months since you elected me president in Canberra, it has been non-stop action and persistent endeavours. We've achieved a lot. I said on day one of my presidency that general practice would be a priority for me, and it has been, and it has paid dividends. We have had some significant wins on this front. Over $1 billion in funding for general practice was announced in the 2019-20 budget and my EFO. $1 billion of funding that both sides of parliament agreed to fund. <laughs> that was no accident or lucky occurrence. We put this on the agenda. Meeting after meeting, submission after submission, consultative forum after consultative forum, departmental briefing or ministerial briefing, everybody was absolutely informed on the pivotal nature of the general practitioner. We reminded them all about the considerable ratcheting down of funding to general practice over the last decade or more. We told them all that significant funding was urgently needed or that the cornerstone of our health system would be under accumulating threat. The AMA has for years pushed for genuine reform to the way general practice is funded. We have advocated for a model that will allow for coordinated patient-centred care which mean, maintains GP stewardship of the system. We have now finally seen some real funding for this with $450 million announced in the budget for GPs to assist the coordinated care for people over 70. This is a good first step, but this policy approach must be expanded. We will be pushing the government to introduce funding for coordinated care for all Australians with chronic illness. Funding that will sit alongside fee-for-service, which will still remain the core of general practice funding. Colleagues, our advocacy led to the bringing forward of the lifting of the five-year freeze on Medicare rebates for GP items by one year to July 2019. This is worth 187 million. While we want funding for better models of care, we also want to make sure that the foundation of the system is sound. This is why we called for a split level B to fix the system, which currently does not encourage hardworking GPs to spend more time with their patients. Our advocacy for more support for GPs to visit residential aged care facility has also been heard. The government's increased funding for GPs visiting aged care facilities and the retained aged care access incentive. This means that visiting patients in aged care facilities remain a viable proposition for GPs who conduct these visits. However, there is still much more to do on this front to ensure that a patient in a registered facility retains the option of being able to have the choice as to which GP they see. We also worked hard to make sure that new programs and initiatives would not negatively impact our members. The government delayed the implementation of the new workforce incentive program by six months to January 1, 2020. It is our view that implementation arrangements should allow for a reasonable transition period to give time to practice, time to, practice to adjust to any changes. 
the commencement of the practice incentive program quality improvement, the PIPQI incentive, was put back to the 1st of August 2019. This means that the asthma incentive, the quality pres uh, prescribing incentive, the cervical screening incentive, the diabetes incentive, and the GP's aged care access incentive will continue to the 31st July 2019. The government will also provide 200 million in additional funding to support this PIPQI incentive. But we're also concerned about the future of general practice, not just for we GPs, who have seen practice costs continue to rise while our rebates have stalled, but for the next generation of GPs. General practice training places have remained undersubscribed for two years running. This is an extremely worrying and ominous sign. It is further evidence of the declining appeal of general practice as a career for an ever-increasing number of graduates. We have called for a review of employment models for GP training program this will be one of the first things to discuss with the newly elected government. Another priority will be public hospitals. Our public hospital report card clearly showed that the public hospital sector is not in good shape. Doctors and nurses are doing more than their fair share. They are having to do more with the funding they have. While governments underfund, they are making a choice to constrain the supply of public health services. We need, uh, we, the consequences are significant, as we all know. They can include increased complications, delayed care, delayed pain relief, and a longer length of stay for admitted patients. In other words, denial or delay of access to public hospital services not only puts the safety of patients at risk, it also undermines a key plank of our universal, world-renowned health system, equity of access. Let me be very clear, public hospital capacity is determined by funding. Public hospitals can't provide faster access to elective surgery unless they are funded to pay for extra theatre sessions, extra ward beds, extra nurses, extra specialists. Ambulance ramping and long waits in emergency departments will not be resolved unless public hospitals have enough money and ward beds with the appropriate skilled staff to accept seriously ill patients. We can't have a hospital system that is stretched so tight that scheduled elective surgery is cancelled because ward beds are needed by seriously ill patients who unexpectedly present in emergency. We can't have a hospital system that is so under-resourced that GPs cannot find the hospital appointment for their patients who need elective surgery. Our public health system should be better than this. It is unacceptable that our public hospitals have been reduced to this Commonwealth contributions to public hospital services is in large part determined by the current National Health Reform Agreement. Under this agreement, Commonwealth funding is indexed at a rate that reflects public hospital input cost increases, offset by efficiency gains. But since public hospitals are service organisations, staff salaries account for a large proportion of total input costs. Nurses, for instance, comprise 41% of the total hospital staff. The annual rate of price indexation applied to Commonwealth funding is trending at 1.6% per annum. But public hospital nursing salaries are rising at a rate of 25 to 3% per annum in most jurisdictions. The greater the magnitude of difference between the annual 1.6% price indexation compared to the annual hospital input cost increases, the greater the pressure on public hospitals to make up that funding gap with inefficiencies. With efficiencies. The AMA is not opposed to the pursuit of public hospital efficiencies, provided they do not drive burnout or reduce the quality of care our hospitals can provide. Efficiency is when patients are seen in the emergency department within clinically recommended timeframes. Efficiency is when patients are admitted for elective surgery within the clinically recommended timeframes. Our public hospitals are struggling and require new funding to be better tomorrow than they are today. We have an ageing and sicker population. Demand for public hospitals is not going to go away and public hospitals need the resources to improve their capacity, their capability and their output. 
There was an opportunity in the election for a genuine contest between the parties to show their commitment to better support our vitally important public hospitals, to fund public hospitals to be better, not just busier, to help our public hospitals improve the quality of their care rather than just the quantity of work each staff member must carry out, and to support our medical and health staff with the resources they need so that they can care for all of us. Our hard-working doctors, nurses and health professionals, like all Australians, do not deserve anything less. Our advocacy for greater funding will continue. The other side of the equation, private health and private health insurance, is also unfinished business. It was impossible for consumers to understand the multiplicity of carve-outs, restrictions and exclusions of the 70,000 variations of policies that made up our private health insurance system. Something had to change. We backed the government's reforms, including the concept of developing gold, silver, bronze insurance products, but the government's reforms do not address affordability in an enduring way. This problem is starkly obvious, even with the slightly smaller 2019 round of premium increases. Yes, the rate of increase has slowed, but it still outstrips inflation, and more importantly, it far outstrips wages growth. How much longer can private health insurance stay affordable with increases in premiums in averaging 4 to 5% a year when wages growth is firmly stuck at around 2%? As we can see in the latest figures, private health insurance coverage is declining with a dozen or so successive quarters of decreasing coverage, now down to 44.6%. Change is needed and it is needed now. There is an increase in corporatisation of private health and the market power is shifting in favour of private health insurers. Insurers should not determine the provision of treatment in Australia. They should not interfere with the clinical judgement of qualified and experienced doctors. Australians do not support a US-style managed healthcare system and neither does the AMA. The AMA believes that the next round of private health reforms needs to focus on protecting the independent clinician decision-making by clinicians who are chosen freely by their patients. And poorly indexed differential insurance rebates must be abolished so that patients can understand what they will receive as an insurance rebate, regardless of the state they live in or the fund they insure with. With the election now over, it's time for an honest discussion about patient out-of-pocket costs. Out-of-pocket costs are negatively affecting consumers' view of the value of having insurance. As a profession, the AMA realise we have some heavy lifting to do on this. The AMA has been very vocal. We do not support egregious billing or the use of administrative or book and booking fees. They are unprofessional, inappropriate and unacceptable. Let us be clear about what constitutes out-of-pocket costs to patients. It must necessarily include other components of payment from the Medicare Benefits Schedule, the MBS, and the health funds. This is not a conversation that can be limited to what doctors charge. Minister Hunt developed a, the, announced the development of a specialist fee transparency website. The AMA agrees that patients want to know what their out-of-pocket costs will be for a health procedure but a website that only shows doctor's fees will not deliver this. To determine an out-of-pocket cost, patients need to know what their rebates will be, they will, will be what they receive from their insurer, and certainly some are far better than others. We must be honest about the reasons why out-of-pockets arise. There has been a five-year freeze on the MBS rebate, a rebate that was inadequate to begin with and this freeze has been mirrored in the rebates paid by many health insurers. But our practice costs have not been frozen. From 2010 to 2018, the PHI premiums increased by a cumulative 49%, compared with health CPI cumulative increase of 40%. By contrast, doctors were faced with a paltry 5.7% increase in the Medicare rebate and the similar or similar level of PHI rebates. We must do better. We cannot scapegoat one group and expect the problem to be resolved. If we can simplify private health insurance products, we must be able to make rebate transparency possible as well. 
An important area of health was neglected during the election campaign and has been neglected for some time. I'm talking about a framework and funding for mental health care. With the election out of the way, I'll be spending much of my second year talking about mental health. Not just talking, in fact, I will be demanding action. The election, and indeed the past decade or more, has been frustrating from an AMA perspective. Despite hundreds of millions of additional dollars in funding thrown at mental illness, we still see massive inconsistencies and in responsibilities for mental health care services. There are huge service gaps, lack of access for many, as, as well as overlaps and duplication of services. Governments have been unable to address the many gaps that exist in mental health. These gaps are the result of Commonwealth and states being responsible for different aspects of health, as well as gaps created by public and private system and between acute and community managed care. Overarching cohesion and responsibility are lacking. These structural and financial divides and divisions are historic and require a massive overhaul of how mental health services are understood, planned, funded and delivered. The AMA has made submissions and I have raised our position statements and recommendations at every opportunity. But we are yet to see reforms of the mental health system or reforms outside of healthcare, such as workplaces, education systems, commitments to social justice outcomes, affordable housing and social services, which we know will improve mental health and economic participation. We have seen some smaller worthwhile commitments made during the election campaign but what I want to see are plans that address the issues facing GPs, emergency department doctors and psychiatrists. This is primarily about access and pathways to appropriate care. Properly funding mental health has been historically neglected. The AMA will be putting the spotlight on mental health. Big picture policy and funding for Indigenous health have been similarly neglected. The AMA report card on Indigenous health continues to be a leading advocacy document. It's a it is significant that the issues that the AMA has campaigned on, such as ending rheumatic heart disease, increasing investment in legal services and justice health outcomes, developing an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander mental health plan, increasing funding for closed the gap programs and promoting healthy choices have been supported. This year's report will be on dental and oral health, we will, I hope, also see significant investment to address another area of underfunding and disadvantage. Similarly, we must revive government focus on preventative health, from all levels of government, in fact. Prevention receives a paltry amount of the total health budget. This completely misses the point of preventative health care. The AMA has been vocal in calling for the release of a national alcohol strategy, as well as a national obesity strategy. These two public health issues that cost the lives and have a huge impost on the health budget. An area where the AMA has raised its profile in addressing domestic, is domestic violence. The AMA's push for increased supports for victims of family and domestic violence has achieved results. Measures such as paid domestic violence leave and financial support for women and children forced to flee their homes are all positions the AMA has strongly been pursuing. We have been working with all the stakeholders in order to achieve these measures. We're a long way off from seeing the cultural changes so desperately needed to prevent violence against women and other forms of domestic abuse. But I am proud to say that the work of the AMA has put this, put in thus far is to achieve these reforms. We have also had successes with rural health. There's been a very welcome additional $60 million in funding to fast track the national rural generalist pathway in the budget. The national medical workforce strategy was also announced. Both of these measures will help deliver much needed doctors to rural and remote communities, but they won't be able to deliver for years. The results of the 2019 AMA Rural Health Issues Survey paint a picture of a rural health system being propped up by hard-working doctors. It shows that we need investment in resources and staff right now, not in 10 years' time. Rural doctors work longer hours and treat sicker patients. They often do it without the resources that are, or infrastructure city doctors take for granted. Despite this, 
These same doctors told us that they love rural medicine. They love the work. They love their patients and their communities, but they just want more support to keep doing it. Rural Australia spoke up very loudly in the election. We will help rural Australia get and keep the health workforce they need and deserve. At last year's AMA National Conference, the AMA supported a motion to develop strategies to drive cultural change within the profession and workplaces in support of equal participation across gender in the medical workforce. This led to the AMA Gender Equity Summit in March this year in Sydney, the first of its kind for the federal AMA. It provided a forum for the medical profession to discuss the cultural and practical barriers to achieving gender equity in the profession. It produced practical recommendations to address underlying systemic and cultural barriers and contributors that impede our progress to achieving that gender equity. Cultural change is particularly important if we are to achieve a level playing field for both men and women in the medical workplace. Equal access to parental leave and flexible work arrangements should be available in all environments. We want to ensure that all doctors can fully participate in the medical workforce and are guaranteed access to a range of flexible employment, return to work and training opportunities. Gender-based workplace discrimination and bias are also significant issues for our female doctors. While the representation of women on the AMA board currently sits at 40%, it is much more variable among our councils and committees, with some doing well, others not so well. The, the AMA has work to do to improve the representation of women in its councils and committees. We have more work to do to support more women to take up on leadership roles, both within the AMA and the broader profession. At the Federal Council meeting held only yesterday, the Federal Council supported a motion to adopt a target of 40% women, 40% men, and a 20% flexible for all AMA councils and committees. We, re we recommended that the AMA board adopts the same with a gender, um, gender diversity target of women holding 50% of federal AMA representative positions overall for attainment by 2021. This is an important first step in the AMA demonstrating its commitment to improving gender diversity in its representative structures. We have a breakfast session on Sunday looking at how we can support women to take on these representative roles within the AMA and I encourage you to attend that session. The health and well-being of the profession is a high priority for the AMA. We have led some innovations recently with the national funding of health services to doctors, and medical students through our subsidiary, Doctors Health Services Proprietary Limited, with funding from the Medical Board of Australia. Advice and referral services are available to doctors and medical students no matter where they live. We are developing a package for educating doctors to treat doctors and medical students. We will improve our profession's capability to respond to and manage health-related issues of our colleagues. With a grant from the Department of Health, we will be establishing a telehealth service for doctors and medical students. Some of you may remember that the government announced during the 2017 National Conference in Melbourne that it would provide funds to support mental health and reduce suicide in the health workforce. One of the initiatives that followed from this funding was a national mental health and suicide framework for the medical profession. The AMA has participated in this initiative this framework is being finalised, it will be important that the profession comes together to ensure that there is continuing momentum for improving doctors' health and wellbeing. Despite these welcome initiatives addressing individual and organisational issues that can harm doctors' physical and mental health remains a challenge for our profession. The rate of suicide amongst our medical professionals, professionals continues to be a blight on our profession. Most doctors have been touched by the loss of a colleague during their careers. Shortly, we will have the privilege of hearing from our international guest, distinguished advocate for physician health, Dr. Michael Myers. He will present a keynote address on how we can protect doctors and their families. In closing, let me outline the immediate road ahead for the AMA and the rest of the term of my presidency. 
As you may recall, last year upon election, I gave you three broad undertakings. Strong advocacy for patient access to primary care, to mental health and aged care, to in-hospital care, for our Indigenous people and those in rural and regional areas. To work improving the collaborative relationships between federal and state and territory AMAs. And ensuring steadiness, security and confidence in the federal AMA secretariat amid a period of external and personnel changes. I believe we've made significant progress, but there is still more to do. Let me add two further promises to you today for the next 12 months. One, vigilance on private health care. I will ensure that the AMA resists any threats to the sustainability of private health care and patient access. It is this access that fundamentally helps underpin access to our health system. Secondly, doctors' health and wellbeing. This will include continuing strong action on mandatory reporting, involving the cooperation between federal and state AMAs, as well as leading coordinated leadership for action in this area. The AMA staff will be overjoyed, no doubt. It has been a very busy year and a difficult time at HQ with policy, position statements, publications, reports, submissions, speeches, hearings, meetings, and the daily business of being one of the most successful and respected lobbying groups in the country. Throw in national conference and the federal election lobbying, and it all adds up to stress and, pre stress and pressure and long hours. But our Secretariat has stood up to the challenge and worked tireless and professionally under the leadership of our Acting Secretary-General and the fellow directors to support myself, Federal Council, the committees and the board to deliver results on your behalf. To borrow a turn of phrase, how good is Secretariat? The board is on the verge of appointing a new Secretary General following an exhaustive, robust and transparent process led by the board. This should take some of the pressure off us and help us set a course for the way ahead for our AMA. You can be assured that we will be doing all in our power to report an even more successful year of achievement at National Conference in Canberra 2020. And for that, I sincerely thank you all. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, well, as the Australian maxim goes, life wasn't meant to be easy, and certainly the life of the AMA president in the year leading up to a federal election is not easy. On behalf of Federal Council and of the AMA membership, congratulations on what you have achieved to date, Tony. Um, your authenticity has at all times shone through and has been your best weapon and our best weapon in the fight for better systems for Australia's doctors to work in and better health care for all Australians. We look forward to what you're going to do for us in the next 12 months in a different environment. And, uh, you know, you have a very big program ahead of you and uh, you please go about your business knowing that you take with you, our respect, our affection, and our support. So National Conference falls this year between the two elections which scaffold AMA advocacy work, the federal election, which they considerately called last weekend, and our own presidential election next May. So this is a precious still moment, and it's our opportunity to focus on the foundation issues for our profession. These are the subjects covered in this year's national conference, and I recommend the program to you. None of these issues is more important, however, than doctors' health, our health. And that is fittingly our first session for national conference this year. So I'd like to introduce uh, an Australian statesman, Dr. Makesh Haikawal, AC, who is chair of the advisory committee of Beyond Blue's National Doctors Mental Health Program and past AMA president to lead this session. 
Mikesh, would you come to the stage? And there'll be some furniture rearrangements, so please bear with us. Just bear with us as the, uh, as the furniture is uh, reorganized for the session and I'll introduce the panelists coming um, uh, in a moment. It's very dangerous, um, open mic, loving audience, past pre present the AMA. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I was just, just going to chat. I know. Ah, oh, she's now. I was just saying, very dangerous. Past AMA president, open mic, loving audience, very dangerous. <laughs> We're just going to organise some of the chairs here, and then I'll introduce you to our, our stellar um, cast uh, for the session. Um, and um, we're working to this set of suggestions uh, how, of how the session so should actually uh, come to a conclusion. So, um, as is customary, I would also like to acknowledge the, the traditional owners of the land in which we meet and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. We have a, a session here um, where Michael Myers, who I'll formally introduce in a moment, uh, will speak. Um, and you've heard some of this from the President's uh, speech already, um, uh, and how important this topic is uh, for uh, our, prof our profession. Um, I'm very pleased to be back in this venue, albeit with a new ma name and a new badge, a new facade. My uh, dear friend, uh, Bill Glasson, who's not here, we always used to call him the late Bill Glasson, he continues to be late. <laughs> and I suppose I learned that from him too, <laughs> which is a bad habit. Um, when we were last here in this venue in 2004, it was a prelude to the federal election that year. And we had in our midst a couple of people you might remember we called Punch and Judy. Punch, uh, sorry, Judy, but went on to become the Prime Minister of Australia, the Honourable Julie Gillard AC. And Punch, of course, was our boxing bl blue Prime Minister, Tony Abbott. So things have happened in, in those years. Are we done? No. <laughs> It's an honor to be uh, able to stand in front of you today and to facilitate what I would consider to be a sentinel discussion, which is the very core of being and the well-being of our emerging generations of doctors. I've been in this advocacy game and this journey for quite some time now, but to my great surprise and eternal pride, I now have a direct vested interest with the son following his grandfather and his parents into our noble profession. Many of you in the audience also have that same joy. There can be no greater spur then to ensure those who follow us enter a far more supportive and a far kinder environment, one which they can flourish in and enjoy and advance. So um, I can't express in words the joy and hope and pride that we have with us here today, the keynote speaker and the panel assembled. This has been a very vital strategy to embed this agenda into the midst of all of us in this health sector. You'll remember, as the President said last uh, two years ago in Melbourne, the Minister, um, uh, Minister Hunt uh, awarded a million dollars towards this program. We'll hear a bit more about that as the session proceeds. <laughs> the chair. <laughs> There's too many bloody chairs. <laughs> I thought I was going all right. <laughs> um, so two years ago, he, pr he awarded a million dollars into this agenda. We'll hear a bit more about that now. But now that the framework is there, um, there's a lot more that we, we can and should be doing. 
Um, um, among uh, other than the, the panelists, there are people in the audience that uh, I'd like to obviously hear from directly, and I'll introduce them as we come to them. Um, and I'd also invite people to think about things that they would like to ask the audience, uh, from the audience. We have a specific amount of time to actually have that interaction, and that interaction is going to be very rich and very important uh, to this conversation. So thank you very much again for your patience and your tolerance. Um, I didn't speak for too long, I hope. Uh, it, it, it could go on longer, but I won't. Um, but it gives me absolute pleasure to invite to the stage Dr. Michael Myers. Michael is a professor of clinical psychiatry at Sunny Down State Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. He's a specialist in physician health and the author and co-author of 150 scientific pu publications and eight books, the most recent of which are Why Physicians Die by Suicide, Lessons Learned from Their Families and Others Who Cared, and The Physician as a Patient, a clinical handbook for mental health professionals with Glenn Gabbard. He treated his first physician patient on Christmas Day, 1970, and this, in, in, this experience launched a decade-long career, helping ailing physicians and their families that continues to this day. He's passionate about advocacy for the rights of physicians, serves on multiple boards and committees of medical associations, pens a monthly blog on physicians' health, and lectures, uh, and lectures extensively throughout North America, the United Kingdom, Europe, and finally, of course, Australia. So, with great thanks to Penny and her team at Event, uh, to Warwick and the team here at AMA for allowing the session to happen, and you, Mr. President, for seeing the vision to make this happen. Uh, please join me in welcoming Michael Myers. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for that introduction, Mukesh, and for the warm welcome. I'm delighted to be here. And I'm, um, I feel good that I'm part of this panel, so I'm the kickoff speaker. So let me get started. Um, greetings from Kings County Hospital and SUNY Downstate Medical Center. I put the dates there because I think we correspond closely to the foundation of Melbourne University School of Medicine, which was about the same time as SUNY Downstate. But there's another reason. We were founded a, in a hospital setting in uh, Kings County to treat the, what were called indigent at that time, and SUNY Downstate to treat the um, new immigrants. Um, as you know, indigent has now been replaced by the word marginalized in many respect. And I use that word specifically because that's the subjective sense that so many doctors feel when they fall ill a sense of inner marginalization. So let me set the stage with this talk. I want to talk about the pressing issues that have a lot to do with thwarting our self-care and wellness. What we can all do, that's a collective response from all of us to effect change. And I want to honor our colleagues and their family members. <coughs> Sorry. All right. I'm here wearing many hats. I was kind of thinking about this as, as you get older, you wear more hats. So I'm wearing the hat of a clinician, a researcher, a professor of psychiatry, an association leadership person. But probably the two most important hats I'm wearing are those of being the doctor's doctor, as well as being a patient myself. And I think that's where I've gained most of my insights. We've already recited the Declaration of Geneva, but let me tell you that for me, this was a watershed moment. I'll never forget Sunday morning, um, October the 15th, which is a beautiful day in New York, and I was sitting outside on my terrace in Harlem, where I live, and picked up the New York Times and saw this, I think on page three, that this had been passed the day before. It brought tears to my eyes because I have been working in this field in w different ways since I was a first year medical student in 1962 when I lost a fellow medical student to suicide. And so to see that finally embedded in a charter is a recognition of the importance of our own health was extremely important and gratifying. And I'm happy to see that Dr. Granin is here today who is there at that meeting and perhaps others in this room. 
I want to borrow a frame of reference. This reference has nothing to do with physician health, but yet I wanted to conceptualize using the three R's that come out of this. So the first one, recognition. We've known about the vulnerabilities of physicians actually since about the middle of the 19th century. And a colleague of mine in the UK who's at Keele University, Professor Alana Tompkins, has written extensively about the vulnerabilities of physicians going back to that uh, era of history. So it's been a long time that we've been aware of this. The re representation, I would say that over the years it's been variable. There's been an ebb and flow to this. Uh, but only now has become quite vociferous, and that's why I'm excited to be here, because there's so much going on in this country. And the rights is the third one. We're still lagging, because in so many respects, we're still a vocal minority, and but yet I just see that getting louder and louder. From my own archive, I broke this down into decades that I've been working. In the 80s, um, and I was, inter I was happy to hear Dr. Bertoni touch on this, about the gender inequities. I was struck by the numbers of medical students and young women physicians who were referred to as girls, whereas we men in medicine were referred to m as men. And there was all other kinds of sexism. And when we fast forward to today, the Me Too movement, you can see that we still have a ways to go. But this has been going on for a long time. But I began to study psychiatric problems of medical students, which were, weren't really being addressed. So, and the th third thing in the 80s was when my writings began on stigma, and I carried those right through until uh, my presidency of the Canadian Psychiatric Association when I, when I incorporated stigma into my presidential theme. Then we move into the 90s, and I, I started to write about the abuse of trainees uh, in our medical centers, especially residents, but some medical students as well. And then I first wrote about suicide in physicians and produced a videotape called Why Physicians Die by Suicide, the same title as my book, but this was many years earlier. And then that moves into then the end of the 90s, and the Canadian Medical Association, our policy paper, Physician Health and Wellbeing, many of us were instrumental in putting this together, and then we opened up the CMA Center for Physician Wellbeing in Ottawa. But at the time, that was also a landmark um, event as well. So let me turn now to common stressors in doctors' lives. We've already been hearing so much from Dr. Bertoni about the work stress, the volume, the ratio of difficult patients, et cetera, et cetera. Um, bullying. That word wasn't in the research until probably 10 to 15 years ago. It was, used, it was called misuse or abuse. The sexes and the micro inequities and microaggressions that we see in minority physicians, which are all instrumental in affecting well-being. The complaints process, we're going to hear more about that by our fellow speakers. Um, some junior people not getting the proper supervision that is necessary and required to prevent medical error. And what I see all too frequently is the spill of stresses in our personal lives into the workplace. And those are doctors who will say to me, I'm not burned out, I love being a doctor, I love my work, but it's my home life and family life that is really in chaotic shape at the moment. When I was thinking about the barriers to self-care, I decided to break this down into three parts, the self, the system, and then also psychiatry and other carers. And I've borrowed a term that you use in this country as well as in the UK that we don't use in North America, which I really like carers because the word care is embedded in that. So with regard to self, if you can read that, because the font's a bit small. The internalized stigma, of course, and that's stuff that we incorporate from growing up in a society has viewed the mentally ill with disdain, misunderstanding, with fear, uh, and with judgment. And so it's pretty hard to shake all of that off. We're getting better at it, but... And the self-blame for becoming ill. Physicians are notorious for beating themselves up for becoming ill. And this says something, I think, about the persona or the macho mystique of men and women in medicine. The rugged individualism, which as you know, is something that gets a lot of us into medical school, but then it's hard to relinquish that and become a patient. And there was a recent paper in JAMA about how physicians don't always trust each other. And when I talk with my doctor patients about why they don't have a GP, often the first response is, and they say this somewhat laughingly, oh, I don't really trust other doctors, ha, ha, ha. Uh, but it's said a jest, but I think there's a little bit in earnest there, and I'll explain that in a minute. And then our defenses that we use, 
inability to accept the patient role, which is very hard. A cute story about a cardiologist who came to see me, always disguised. He wanted to see me in my hospital-based office. I'll never forget he was sitting opposite me with his white coat, a stethoscope around his neck. And about 12 minutes into his story, he looked at me, he paused and said, Dr. Myers, do you mind if I examine your chest? <laughs> <laughs> and I laughed, just sort of like you're all laughing right now, and then he started to laugh. It was a very tender, intimate moment. And he said, it would be so much easier to listen to your chest than to talk about what's going on in my life right now. And, you know, I just reassured him about that and, you know, let him take his time. The final one is hypertrophied altruism, that we give so much to others that we just don't, really don't take care of ourselves. And I say all of these stuff, by the way, without judgment. These are some things that are so endemic in the uh, practice of medicine. Now, here are the systemic things that work against us going for help. Long work hours. I've heard, when am I going to go see somebody? I don't have time in my work schedule to even go to a doctor. The enacted stigma. Another word for enacted stigma, because it's exterior, is actually discrimination. And we're going to hear about that more, I think, from our panel as well. But it's extremely important because that really gets to the heart of why many physicians are hesitant to go for help. Exclusion clauses in disability insurance, mandatory reporting, we'll hear more about that, and the misunderstanding about that. Electronic health records that people are afraid of. Pharmacy networks, what about my privacy? And I see this occasionally where some families will not accept that they actually have a physician loved one who's ill. It's just too hard for them to so-called get their head around. And that makes it even harder for the lonely physician who's struggling. And then also what Dr. Bertoni was saying, there's a dearth of GPs and a dearth of psychiatrists who are available and able to look after us in our hour of need. Now the third one I want to turn to are, is our psychiatry and other carers. And so I align myself with any and all of the psychiatrists and other mental health professionals in this room that we really need to look to as whether or not we've got some residual internalized stigma that we don't always, that we don't always recognize and then maybe that gets projected out when we're looking after our fellow physicians. One of the complaints about our care sometimes is what I call biomedical rigidity and pharmacological ascendancy. Not nearly enough emphasis put on the physician as patient, as human being, and especially the person within requiring a, just some plain good old-fashioned psychotherapy. And in small communities, where do you find somebody who could be an objective carer where there aren't problems with conflict of interest? And then others who really feel that, and I've seen this in my own work, where when I've tried to ask a fellow psychiatrist if he or she would take a patient that I just can't accommodate right now, they say, well, I will, but she's going to have to get to the end of my queue, just like everybody else. See, I grew up in the era of professional courtesy, uh, but that's very, very different now. Our system is very, very different. Okay, let's look at what the individual himself or herself, and Betty, by the way, any of you in this audience who have been patients yourself will know exactly what I'm talking about here. The sense of shame, the denial of symptoms, especially suicidality, because it's not easy to talk about. It's embarrassing and it's scary. That sense of inferiority that they feel one down because they're, they're not in your office in their patient role. Fear of us, and there's a lot to be afraid of in terms of the power that we have to involuntarily put people in the hospital, some of the medications that we use that patients are afraid of, that they'll be used on them without their consent, these kinds of things that, you know, yes, are some of the fears irrational? Sometimes, but yet there's, there's a germ of truth in many of these things. The intellectualization, that's meaning staying in the patient role, or in the doctor role, mixed feelings about us, competition with us, and the need to be in control and taking charge, hard to relinquish the control. <coughs> now, what about the psychiatrist? I call this the mirror effect. They are us. We can see ourselves in our own conflicts in the same examining room. The boundary blurring that doesn't occur if our patient is not a physician. The fears of contagion, underdiagnosing because we skip things. We assume that our doctor patient will be able to do the basic things, but they can't because they're not feeling well, and they deserve and want and need to be treated as a patient. So we need to really, really work on that. The intimidation that we feel, especially if we're looking after a physician of stature, and we feel maybe somewhat inti in intimidated by that individual, those individuals need our care as well. 
and we just have to do it and realize that, yes, they could have, um, they could be a VIP, but at the moment, they're not feeling well and they need our services. Narcissism in the physician's doctor, that they feel, I must be pretty good, I got a lot of doctors coming to me, and that can really be uh, a slippery slope. Competition with the patient, gender collusion and clashing, again, Dr. T uh, Bartoni talked about this, and enabling, where we've got problems going on ourselves, and then we just sort of enable our physician patients. Let me turn now to what we all need to do and can do as a group. The number one priority, of course, is our own personal wellness. Because many of us weren't trained that way to put ourselves first. But our patients, of course, are the benefactors when and if we are taking care of ourselves. The number two um, is, of course, our family. And I, I mean that both the immediate family and family of heart, as well as extended family. And boundaries are extremely important between work and home, especially, I mean this when we're not on call, of course. We don't need to walk around with our pagers and cell phones all ready to be sort of notified or whatever. There are no emergencies. Our families will love us for it when you do that. And what about this one? That we just have to accept that life ain't easy for a lot of people, that some of the things that will befall us are inevitable. And yes, they're gonna be hard or whatever, but if we can philosophically accept that in ourselves, it, make us, it makes us a lot eas easier for us to carry on. We've gotta face these forces and losses, and these types of things. Um, you know, many of us do and have to, and people get through these things and volunteer to serve. There's so much in volunteerism that really makes a difference as well, and for that time, we're able to put our own needs aside, and that's very helpful. Finding a GP, okay? How do you find some, in fact, those of you in the audience who are GPs to other doctors, I salute you, and you're gonna see some of the things that I feel really, can explain why that's working, but sometimes why it isn't. So we gotta find somebody who's available and is interested in treating other physicians, okay? Someone who allows and expects to, uh, you to assume the patient role, okay? Someone who's at arm's length. When I was researching my latest book, I talked to a woman who lost her husband to suicide. Her concern about her, her husband's care was that the physician looking after her husband was actually an employee of his. And she just felt that her husband really kind of dominated the care and that he really didn't get the care that he deserved. And then here's a salute, I think, to doctors looking after other doctors who are doing it well. They have this sort of wonderful mix of caring and empathy, but yet clinical objectivity. They've got thoroughness and firmness when necessary. What are our personal needs? basically, aren't they? The things that we either used to do or we need to keep doing, relaxation, so nutrition, all of this is very, very straightforward. There's nothing uh, new here except to kind of remind yourself of the, about the importance of these things. <coughs> A salute to Dr. Ann Mallett, who's here today, and I'm delighted that I've just met her in person. I uh, got onto this website some time ago, actually, and um, Dr. Jane Barker, her uh, co, um, uh, uh, I guess, operator of the, of the uh, website. It's wonderful. I tell all of our medical students about it, especially because there's such a huge medical student section. And those are some of the themes and areas that are indeed looked at. But one of the things that I love so much is as, as a stranger, when I first began to communicate with Drs. Mallet and Barker, was they sign all of their emails with love. That's pretty nice to get an email with love from somebody that you've never met, but you respect, that type of thing. And don't we all need something like that once in a while? Respecting your family's needs, okay? We, they have a right that we can't keep coming home sort of um, used up. Yes, when we're on call, working very difficult shifts, that's a sort of different thing. They want us to practice saying no to the demands of work. Um, this is one thing that's very tempting in medicine, that if we're going through a rough time or things aren't good at home, it's tempting to take on extra work because usually we're good at it and it's a way then of not having to face the problems at home. But it's a vicious circle and I urge you not to get into that. It's basically, obviously, so much more important and essential to deal with things at home. Um, the, the bullet from the bottom, accepting that your work as a physician is no more important than that of your spouse and your other loved ones, including your children, 
that's a very big one, especially those of you in medicine who are doing like really big exciting things like transplant surgery, those types of things, or so many of the other highly, highly subspecialized branches of medicine. And it's got to do with how do we define importance, okay? Because is it not, not as important for somebody who's providing a lot of nurturing at home as well as the things that our children are doing as well? So it's something to really think about because too often we don't. Let me finish now. There's so many people I want to honor. Um, as somebody who's been working in this field for such a long time and paying attention to fellow advocates, um, Leone, Eagles. That's the mother of Chloe Abbott, and many of you will know because she's been referred to already. And so much, I think, of why I'm here today and this panel is put together is uh, in respect to young Chloe Abbott. Um, so for her mom to be awarded, I think by Mukesh, actually, Pride of Australia medal, I'm glad that her two sisters are here today, Jessica and Michaela. Could each of you stand up and just sort of say hello? Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, what's not coming through in that yellow one at the bottom are individuals who have shared their stories both anonymously and giving their names uh, with the Healthcare Complaints Commission, because this hasn't been easy to do. But these are things we all need to know about and hear about. And then also, too, which isn't coming through on the screen, which I'm not sure why that is. Um, is, oh no, I've got to get his name right. Steve Robson. Yeah, Steve Robson, who I'm going to be meeting this week and I'm delighted to do that. When I read his piece, it's very powerful. I think he's either the current or immediate past president um, of the Royal College of uh, uh, OBGYN. Um, for those of you who don't know the story, um, and also the young woman too, and her, her name isn't coming through either, uh, who reached out to him, is because these have both been written up. but toward the end of his training, during his training, he made a near lethal suicide attempt. And it was actually what we call in suicidology an abortive suicide attempt. And fortunately, there was that intervention that saved his life. But for many, many years, he was not able to talk about it. And then after meeting Jeff and others, he decided he had to share this and go public. It's very powerful. It's been tweeted all over the world. And in so many of my travels, people are very aware of Dr. Robson and that fine work he's doing. <coughs> Gavin Larkin, who I don't know, and his family founder of the Suicide Prevention Movement, Are You Okay? Jeff Tugood, who I'm delighted to be, have on this panel today, he's gonna speak. Dr. Sandra Hirawati, who's here in the audience, who I've known for years from British Columbia, Canada, in her work with rural doctors, but always a beacon, though, for the health and well-being of fellow physicians. Um, Dr. Miko Kadota, uh, who's also been written up, and I'll be taking part in a session with her and with Jeff later, or actually ne ne next week in Melbourne, uh, a young plastic surgeon resident who has left that field because of just so many um, sort of toxic factors uh, and has now become a real spokesperson and advocate. And Dr. Kate Harding, who will also be part of that, she's the widow of a physician who took his life. She's a GP herself. Uh, he was an anesthesiologist. Dr. Helen Schultz, who's on this panel, who's a psychiatrist and doctor's doctor, Dr. Tony Bartoni, who spoke so eloquently a few minutes ago, Brad Hazard, your health minister, Professor Ian Hickey, Black Dog Institute, Dr. Mukesh Hagra, who I refer to you, Mukesh, as a man for all seasons, Sharon Verdes, who wrote that phenomenal article, Wounded Healers, about a year ago now, and the Mezrani family and the Bryant family. We may hear more about those both um, both families lost their husband, father, uh, to suicide, and they're all involved in doing something, things like that, to make a difference. Finally, the last slide, Anne Lamott, who's one of my favorite writers uh, in the U.S., she's so much more than a novelist, but hope begins in the dark. The stubborn hope that if you just show up and try to do the right thing, the dawn will come as it does. You wait and you watch and work. You don't give up. Thank you all this morning for being here.
problemas. That's it. What can I say? Um, there is going to be opportunity to talk about uh, the, co the conversations we'll have. Uh, there's mics will be at the back, um, and I said it will come to the, the various panelists and then our uh, other guests to say a few words first. So I'm now going to invite Dr. Dr. Jeff Tugud to speak to us. Jeff is a uh, tireless advocate in this space. Uh, he's a cardiologist in uh, Melbourne, working in Nepean, uh, not in Nepean, Nepean Peninsula, in the Nepean area. And uh, he's also a, uh, at the Alfred Hospital. Uh, you'll have seen and heard Jeff uh, in many places because he's been, as I said, tireless. Um, he swims and he talks. And he's going to talk to us now and tell us just what his story is and how he thinks we should be moving this agenda forward. Jeff, thank please, thank you very much. That's good. I'm going to walk and talk rather than behind the podium. I'm going to touch on a few things that Michael's touched on. Um, from a personal story. And I'm going to talk about two things. Stigma and vulnerability. And I've got this here first, mainly not for the notes, but mainly the first time I walked into my GP surgery, first time I walked into my psychiatric uh, consultation, I sat behind a magazine because I feared being seen. I didn't want people to know, as a doctor, that I'd failed. And I think I've come to kind of realise the single probably one of the most important things for me that almost led me to be one of those statistics was stigma. And the stigma within me and the stigma within the profession. We kind of grow up thinking that we're bulletproof. And I thought when I was actually ill and suicidal and not coping, in inverted commas, that I was the only doctor in the hospital that was doing that. But I've come to realise that that's not true. And I started to speak to make sh to embrace that vulnerability so other people would get help and not go through the same things that I went through. So how, what are the sort of things I sort of, I was scared that the, another patient would see me in the general practice of surgery, even though I desperately needed to go in there because I was actively suicidal. When I walked into the psychiatric clinic, and it's a big clinic full of lots of psychiatrists, I also thought other colleagues would see me. Because one of the things that we also face in medicine is privacy about our medical information. You know, and it's said a lie goes halfway around the world before truth gets out of bed. In the medical grapevine, sometimes your medical history goes halfway around the medical world before you work out of the office. And that's not helpful to your recovery. How, what was the other sort of external factors and stigma? Well, well, many colleagues suggested after 15 years to 20 years in clinical practice that perhaps he wasn't cut out for this job, I should try something else. There you go that I wasn't resilient enough, I wasn't strong enough, if I'd only done more mindfulness training, if I'd only done a little bit more exercise. Remember, I swam a relay across the English Channel when I swam from Perth to Rottnest. That's a lot of swimming, okay? <laughs> People also said to me that I was playing the victim as well. But how else does stigma affect us as well? Every time I fill in my, re, uh, my medical board reapplication, it's there. Have you got a past history that will affect you? Every time you fill in your application, you're in a hospital. It's there. I can't get life insurance for my mental health condition. I can't get travel insurance for my mental health insurance condition. And I can't get um, income protection for my mental health condition. So the stigma keeps going and going and going. So no wonder we don't go out and seek help. And I think uh, the other thing that we do is we stigmatise our colleagues with mental health issues. I don't want to talk too long, but out of all these, out of sometimes bad becomes good. How did this campaign start? This campaign started 
because they wore a pair of odd socks to work. Now they sell odd socks in packages in the, super, <laughs> in the, in the you know, shops. So luckily I got in a few, week, few years earlier. And the point that I make is at that time, instead of people coming up to me and asking, was I okay? There was the back chat behind the back, this steering, he's going off again. How much easier would it have been if someone had actually come up and talked to me and asked me, was I okay? Is there anything I can do? But I'm internally grateful to those two people because that led the start of a stigma campaign and an awareness campaign. Because I think if we don't kind of walk around, talk and look after ourselves with mental health, we're not we're setting a very poor example to the community. How can we stigmatise ours and not ask the community not to embrace uh, people getting help and in workplaces? The last thing I want to say is I, it was largely me that saved me with the help of a couple of, you know, my general practitioner who was fantastic and I'm eternally grateful to her, she's now retired, my psychiatrist and my psychologist. I wasn't saved or protected by the system in which I worked in, nor by the colleges for which I'm a member of. And that's something I also want to change. So much is focused on us getting help and us being the weakness, and I think we've done a lot. A lot of people are working on that, but we can only do so much. And unless we change the system, unless we work in, while we're changing and doing a lot of work for ourselves, we'll still lose doctors. I always dedicate my children, often the Abbott family aren't here when I dedicate things to Chloe and, and other members, but um, uh, when I speak, I speak for the people that are left behind as well. And I think we should always thank their bravery for coming. Thank you. Thanks, mate. I'm going to ask Jessica to head towards the podium. She's got a few slides to share with us. And I'm... Um, it's on the, on the top there. Uh, so um, I'm going to, how am I going to... How can you introduce Jessica? Well, Jessica was AMSA president, and the first time I met her was in Hammamet, which is in Tunisia, where she was representing Australia International Federation of Medical Students, and we bought pizza in front of Hannibal's Elephants. So if you want to know where Hannibal's, Hannibal's Elephants live, it's Hammamet. Jessica is an amazing person who's qualified in both law and medicine. Uh, she's just passed her exam to intensive care and is now an advanced training, recently married. <laughs> uh, congratulations. And also, she's on the board of Beyond Blue with me. And much of the stuff you've seen recently in this space was from the 2013 survey, which many people in this room participated in. And many of the themes that Jeff spoke about uh, and his own experience are things that we're uh, obviously advocating for uh, as, uh, across the agenda with those groups. Jessica, please. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today to talk to you all about an issue that affects each and every one of us, both individually and as a community. We're here today to talk about the mental health of our profession. I want you all to take a moment. I want you to think about a time that you had a colleague who was having a hard time, who was struggling. Many of us can. I now want you to think about a time when you were struggling with your mental health and with everything that was on your plate. I put to you that many of you may have described that period as the perfect storm. Perhaps you were rotating rurally away from friends and family. Perhaps you were in internship and new to the profession. Perhaps it was around specialty exams. Perhaps it was financial stresses in private practice. Perhaps you were working crazy hours or were unsupported by your seniors. Perhaps you made a mistake. Perhaps you also had personal stresses, a baby, a family crisis, all at the same time. Today I want to talk about structural reform, about addressing these embedded stresses. We know what they are. We've known what they are for decades. 
but we need to acknowledge them and address them and eradicate them once and for all. Some of you may remember, here at National Conference two years ago, Minister Greg Hunt pledged funds to plan and deliver specific research trials and translational research to better understand how to prevent the onset and severity of anxiety, depression and suicidal behaviour among the medical workforce. I've been fortunate to have been part of the steering group, involving an important collaboration between Everymind, Origin, United Synergies, Black Dog Institute and the AMA. There are five project streams as part of this initiative. The first is the medical student intervention. Origin has led a review of medical school curricula relating to mental health and suicide prevention for medical students, as well as extensive student consultations around the country. This research has led to an evidence-based intervention for medical students. The Black Dog Systematic Review investigated current interventions in the doctors in training population, as well as extensive consultations in this group that will lead to an evidence-informed pilot intervention. If we were to look at the origin and the black dog systematic reviews in isolation, we might be swayed to take an individual level approach. These systematic reviews do support mindfulness interventions and mental health literacy training, particularly suicidal, uh, suicidal literacy training, mostly because they are the only interventions that have been tried and evaluated in the literature. The focus groups, however, affirmed that what we as doctors have known for many, many years the intervention that we move forward with has to be at a population level and it has to be comprehensive. The next project stream has focused on interrogating the national coronial data to qu clarify and quantify the incidence of doctor suicide. The fourth project stream has investigated the development of a toolkit to support the mental health of anaesthetists as a craft group. And the final project stream and the main topic of our talk today is the national framework. So the evidence. Doctors and medical students experience above average outcomes for physical health, but they are at a higher risk for mental ill health and suicide compared to the general population. We know this. We've known this since the Beyond Blue survey in 2013. Internationally, there have been a range of different measures used to assess rates of mental ill health in doctors and medical students. However, the research consistently demonstrates that the medical profession has an increased risk of depression and anxiety compared to the general public. Data also indicates that there is a variable risk for mental ill health depending on medical specialty, age, gender and cultural background. For example, young doctors have been shown to exhibit higher rates of distress and burnout compared to older doctors with more experience. Indigenous doctors and medical students report higher levels of psychological distress than their non-Indigenous peers. Relative to their male counterparts, female doctors report higher rates of depression, anxiety and current psychological distress. In regards to suicide, there exists some discrepancy in the reported level of risk experienced by doctors and medical students. There is research to suggest that female doctors have a higher risk of suicide compared to females in the general population. And some findings indicate that medical professions, professionals have an elevated risk more broadly. The framework is what I'm really excited to talk about. Through months of consultations, we have developed an evidence-informed draft framework with the goal of collective action to prevent mental ill health and suicidal behaviour, but to go a step beyond that, to support good mental health for all doctors and medical students. This framework brings together the best available evidence for what works to prevent and respond to mental ill health and suicide and applies it to the medical profession. The guiding principles of the framework, the well-being of the medical profession is a national priority requiring a coordinated and resourced approach. Environments that value, develop and support the medical profession are conducive to good patient care targeting the structural and environmental risk factors impacting on the medical profession is an immediate priority. Medical professionals who experience mental ill health and suicidal behaviour can and do provide quality patient care. And support from all key stakeholders is required to ensure implementation and evaluation of evidence-based interventions across the settings. There are a number of pillars embedded in the framework. The first is obviously primary prevention. 
This involves improving training and work environments to reduce risk. This includes systems change to prevent job strain, fatigue and burnout across the medical profession. A huge component of prevention is addressing these modifiable stresses. These are straightforward. They're appropriate rostering, access to sick leave and other leave entitlements, flexible working conditions, appropriate staffing with appropriate workloads. It isn't rocket science. In ICU or emergency departments overnight, we make complex decisions at 5 a.m. when we know our brains are not working at their best. Decisions that could potentially kill people. Pilots, on the other hand, and I spoke to a pilot in the lobby this morning to confirm this, they have two flying crews overnight. They spend 50% of their time resting and 50% flying. They're not allowed to come to work if they're tired. And we're still trying to stamp out 16-hour shifts. How can we be so naive to think that we are invincible to fatigue and invincible to burnout? Reanalysis of the Beyond Blue data supports that rostering is important, that there is a statistically significant increase in risk of depression, anxiety and burnout when doctors work greater than 50 hours a week. This presents a challenge for us as a profession in terms of our messaging. We need to balance the protection of adequate training while mitigating fatigue and burnout with safe rostering. This includes safe and inclusive training and work environments where bullying and discrimination are not tolerated. Secondary prevention. This involves improving the capacity to recognise and respond to those needing support. Mandatory reporting. So mandatory reporting legislation must be changed to mirror the Western Australian model which exempts treating doctors from reporting their doctor patients. It's a really important first step in the process. Doctors and medical students must be supported across all of the environments and settings in which they work, in private practice, in hospitals, in the community. They need to be supported always. Effective pathways to evidence-based care must be available to the medical profession. Helen's speaking more to this, but why are we not providing our colleagues the same level of care that we would provide our patients? <coughs> Tertiary prevention. Improving the response to doctors and medical students impacted by mental health and suicidal behaviour. Jeff just shared his story with us about his complex road to recovery, and it shows just how hard we make it for individuals individuals trying to reaccess the workforce. Recovery at work practices should be implemented across all settings where medical professionals work and train. We as a profession have experienced too many suicides and yet we still lack an effective postvention response system. Mental health promotion, improving the culture of the medical profession to enable wellbeing. I'm going to share a quote from one of our focus groups where one medical student participant said, we're in a context where we're constantly ranking ourselves against each other, trying to climb higher. That's sort of instilled in every student from day one, and that's the path you're expected to take up, and you're not worthy of anything unless you can climb to the top. Cultural change is difficult and it's complex. It needs to come from the top. It needs to be led by you, the leaders of the profession, and AMA as our peak representative body. And that brings us to leadership. We need to improve coordinated action and accountability. This speaks to the next phase. Such a complex intervention will require a representative, cohesive national leadership group of leaders and champions from within the profession. This body of work has been completed by a number of important research organisations, but the next phase needs to be led by the profession. It includes the colleges and specialty craft groups. The colleges are in such a powerful position to address these cultural as well as structural issues. We've already seen how effective the accreditation process can be in identifying and addressing bullying and harassment. It includes industrial change. ASMOF and the AMA, we need buy-in from the health services, from the state and from the federal governments. The state enterprise agreements are a really key opportunity here. We need basic entitlements and we need them enforced. We need genuine penalties for a lack of compliance. And the AMA, it needs to be a national priority for our profession from the top. 
and this leadership group must be adequately resourced to oversee the implementation and the monitoring of the framework. What's the point of all of this work if we can't adequately implement it? And lastly, action. The goal is not for the framework document to be perfect. Sometimes we can get really caught up on the wording. It's for it to be an effective instrument to galvanise change. But we need your help. The only way this body of work is going to lead to real change is if you, as a profession, genuinely engage with the process. We need buy-in, and together we can develop an implementation strategy that is actually going to work. If you are someone who wants to get involved in the process, we want to hear from you. We want to hear what you think about the framework and we want to hear your suggestions for implementation. We now have the momentum and the opportunity to make these changes, but we need to set up the leadership structure, we need the political support to lobby for funding and resources, but the time is now. I remember standing here as AMSA president in 2014 begging the AMA to pick up the issue of mental health in medical students and doctors in training. I'm here again, five years later, calling on the medical profession to engage, to stand up, and to improve the mental health of our profession. We now know exactly what needs to be done. We just have to do it. Thank you. So, a call to arms. I showed you some, a slide at the beginning of the session with some suggested words to drive that a bit further forward. I now would like to introduce to you Dr. Helen Schultz. She's one of us. She was a junior doctor representative from Victoria uh, in my presidency. And um, she's been working very tirelessly in this area. She's a consultant psychiatrist in Melbourne. Um, she's run many groups on this. We went to a session actually in Albury when we had a, a loss of life in Albury Wodonga not that long ago, unfortunately, um, and has been uh, coordinating some of these groups uh, of people who have, who have suffered uh, in this way. She's a great advocate for our profession, a tireless advocate in this specific space, and she's got a clinic that works specifically in this area now. So please welcome Helen. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much for inviting me to speak amongst colleagues I truly admire and respect who uh, work so beautifully in this space. Thank you. I am actually a former DIP president. I was in the position in Victoria in 2002 and yes, since that time I have tirelessly been in this space around doctors' mental health in lots of different ways, probably more recently as a tireless advocate to get rid of mandatory reporting laws that absolutely ruin our profession, which you can imagine makes me so uh, popular. But I'll keep doing it because I know that's one of the most important parts of this crusade and thank you Jess for mentioning that. Most recently though, uh, I was very inspired to become, uh, I'm not sure if I can call myself a doctor's doctor, but I wanted to use my psychiatric skills and knowledge and expertise to actually start treating doctors and medical students in a more formal setting. So I was already doing it informally in my practice, but I couldn't help but notice that the doctors were that were coming to me were only coming every six months for half an hour and expecting me to be able to provide the same level of evidence-based care that I was providing to my other patients. So I thought about all the things that I could do differently to move into this space, which I must tell you is one of the most rewarding and fulfilling parts of my career to date. I did meet Dr Myers last year. I went on a bucket list 50th birthday trip, road trip to America with my son. And I made sure that I, I dropped in on Dr Myers while I was there in Brooklyn, as Aussies do, when we go across to the other side of the globe. And I can't tell you how much that wonderful meeting, less than an hour, has changed my life in the sense that it has brought together so many people that I've watched from afar and have also met uh, in this space and makes me feel much more united to keep working here. I am particularly buoyed by the tragic loss of three psychiatry registrars and one intern within three weeks at the start of 2015. One I worked with closely as a principal registrar at St Vincent's Hospital. And I won't be silenced about the fact that that affected my specialty of medicine. Before I started out in this little area of developing a niche private practice in doctors' mental health, I had to really think about all the barriers that I could see that were to barriers to help seeking behaviour so that I could actually address one by one and hope to make the clinic a success. I have to say that the, on the top of the list, number one, was the idea of stigma. 
I feel stigma pervades all the practical and emotional aspects to becoming a patient with a mental health condition. Stigma within us and stigma around us. Discrimination on the grounds of being perceived as impaired or even different stops most doctors from attending appointments during work hours in case somebody notices. But what have I already noticed or encountered since starting this work only eight months ago? Number one, doctors fear running into other people when they go to treatment settings. They fear getting prescriptions filled from local pharmacies that they often have a professional relationship with. They don't like using Medicare and will often pay me up front the full cost of my care without getting the Medicare rebate. This is one of the most important parts of my talk is that doctors at the moment feel hugely discriminated against when they automatically incur, incur exclusions on insurance policies and income protection because of even one contact with a me mental health professional, regardless of reason. That is akin for our medical colleagues out there to having an aberration on a blood pressure reading and calling that a formal diagnosis of hypertension. It's exactly the same thing. Doctors do cut corners when they realise they need help. They don't want to, but they do. They do that because of the fears, uh, because of these fears, sorry. They do that and they often ask colleagues to help them out with referrals, writing prescriptions and the like. Often busy doctors in general practices will lock off ask, often ask GPs down the hallway to help them out with referrals and prescriptions. Uh, if I have to write a letter back about a doctor patient, they won't let me actually include very much material in the letter back to the GP. They are very scared of my health record for themselves and their families and have usually opted out. On the other side though, doctors and medical students are extremely grateful for care. Doctors, above all else, have what we call in the game an internal locus of control. They rarely blame others for anything that happens to them. They often blame themselves. Even when the matter is a complaint from a patient who's disgruntled, they will still look for what they did wrong. But on the other hand, overwhelmingly, doctors are no different to anyone else with a mental health condition. Doctors and medical students respond exactly the same way to evidence-based care as the rest of our patients. And they should be treated exactly the same way but because of these other barriers to help seeking, they're often not. Again, part of this is stigma, but part of it is also that doctors, when they present as patients, assume a different role. They present differently. So if they present with depression or anxiety, they may actually look different to another patient with the same thing. Doctors are extremely good at prevent presenting as very okay. They will spend a lot of the session explaining to you that they are okay. Uh, and that they don't need medication, they don't need regular follow-up or in extreme cases, they don't need leave from hospitals or actually being hospitalised themselves. And this really needs to be tackled head on by anyone who's actually treating doctors and medical students as patients. We should never acquiesce or even in the extreme cases collude with the patient. If a patient tells us they're having strong suicidal thoughts and actually have a plan, absolutely not can they go to work the next day. So when I was dying, designing my service, sorry, I embraced some of these factors and I embraced it with the overarching idea that no matter what the doctor or medical student fears when they come to see me, the outcome is never as bad as they think and the alternative of dying by suicide is never an option. What I've actually designed in my clinic after careful consideration, after hours appointments, including weekends, a discreet location away from any hospital setting with no signage, 15 minutes between appointments to make sure that every doctor and medical student that comes can feel that their, their service is private and confidential, a very laid back consulting room that doesn't look too clinical. I use telepsychiatry when I can work out how to bill it through Medicare to make sure that I can offer a geographical solution to some of the doctors that can't get help and it also allows me to transport my care for doctors that are on rotations and moving through while training. I, I try and offer a very more user-friendly scaled up or scaled down approach, so some doctors see me for mentorship and coaching rather than if someone comes with a diagnosable mental health condition, I will scale up the clinical side. As a psychiatrist, I respect that my specialty is wholly and solely responsible for specialised mental health care 
and we need a better selling story. A lot of the stigma that I find with people that come to see me is not because they have a mental health condition, it's because their life has led to the point that they actually need to see a psychiatrist. And that sounds funny, but it's true. And we need to do a lot better with explaining to other members of our medical profession exactly what we do, the amount of risk that we deal with, and how we can help. So what have I actually found as part of developing this clinic? I now have 40 doctors and medical students under my care as of yesterday. Male and female doctors are coming in equal numbers. Females are slightly overrepresented, so men will come for help. The majority of people seeing me do not have a diagnosable mental illness, but are suffering profound psychological distress. So therefore, they're very amenable to psychological therapies uh, rather than medications. The fear of mandatory reporting is rife and a lot of the reason that people are seeking me out right now is they believe because of my advocacy work I understand mandatory reporting and I won't dob them in. About a third of their, uh, their directly because of problems with third party people including colleges, APRA, the coroner's court and complaints. I have not met one doctor or medical student that is there because they've seen something in, at work, facing a very difficult event at work uh, unless there's some other sort of form of overlay with regards to third party. Doctors can manage extreme life events pretty well. Uh, I don't buy the argument that doctors and medical students aren't cut out for the real craft of practicing medicine. Almost half of my patients are GPs or consultants and their pressures, although different to doctors in training, are still as distressing and disabling. Despite my initial concerns, doctors and medical students are reliable rarely not turning up and do prioritise the sessions in their busy week. A proportion of doctors are presenting for the very first time to anybody, often to talk about things that have happened years ago or for help with symptoms that have been present for months. I have had to admit doctors to hospital and they have still gone on to have flourishing careers. Lastly, but not least, suicidality. You may conclude from all of my talks that I'm actually just treating worried well. It's often something that psychiatrists have to face in private practice. But I know I'm not. Doctors and medical students are presenting to me not only with suicidal ideation, but plans, intent and recent or past attempts. They make up a significant number of the people that I'm currently seeing. In these situations, I need to be able to pick this up and manage accordingly because doctors do present a lot better than they actually are. So I hope these insights help enrich the discussion today. Please remember there's always someone to turn to if you don't feel safe, or life isn't the best way it could possibly be for you, because we're all worth it. I'll now invite uh, Penny Brown to come to the podium. Penny is well known to us. She's often at our conferences. She's the Chief Medical Officer for Avant Mutual, works as a GP as well, and has been very instrumental in putting this p uh, panel together. And I do thank you very much, Penny, for all the work that you do every day and for helping out today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mikesh, and thank you very much for inviting me to this very esteemed panel. I actually feel quite honoured to be a part of this. But actually, it gives me an opportunity to talk about one of the reasons why I'm doing the job that I'm doing today. I came into Avant actually as a medical advisor to support doctors with complaints and, complain and claims and was actually quite surprised and overwhelmed actually at the degree of distress that I saw amongst the doctors before me. And I've been fortunate enough now to come into a position where I actually can try and do something in an advocacy role and ad education to actually try and change some of the parameters. We've already heard from some of the previous speakers about the impacts and the pointy end of when doctors are involved in complaints and claims and what that does and why that is such a significant trigger for mental health for our peers. Not surprisingly, the, the findings of the impacts of complaints and claims is that we see anecdotally is mirrored by the research. There's been quite good research locally by Louise Nash, albeit quite a few years ago now, and in America and in the UK. In the UK, there was a very large study done by Bourne et al that looked at the impact 
of being involved with the regulator, the General Medical Council on doctors. And I quote a couple of the, the bits on the slide that doctors that were involved in complaints to the regulator were 3.78 times more likely to report suicidal thoughts. This doesn't surprise us, but it's actually borne out by the data. The other interesting element, I think, of the Bourne study, and I guess this comes to our role as well at, at Avant, is the concern, it's a fairly circular impact. So a doctor that's involved in a complaint or claim or is currently under treatment for stress, anxiety and depression, this impacts their practice. They actually become more anxious. There's evidence from the study that shows that they are avoidant, hesitant, there's a word they call hedging. And of course that then becomes circular because if they're depressed and they're anxious and they're anxious to make decisions which we all have to make every day in our practices, then in fact they're more likely to have another complaint or claim. So this circular problem is an ongoing one. And for you, if you think you are not one of the ones that are rising number of people that are, are having complaints to the regulator, Unfortunately, you just need to be working in a practice alongside somebody who has a complaint or a claim or is under investigation to actually, to actually have some of these impacts. So that those observing a colleague's experience, 73% of them changed their practice, 82% reported this hedging and 40% reported avoidance behaviour. And I think if we all reflect on it, I'm sure we could probably consider moments like that ourselves in our practice. At Avant, we do offer a range of support, and I just wanted to briefly touch on this, but then take you to the next step. So, of course, we do the legal support, and we wrap our arms around somebody that's involved in a, in a claim or a complaint legally in a range of ways, as per the slide. We also do a lot of work on personal empowerment because one of the paradigms, of course, is that sense of the loss of control and we try as much as possible to give the doctor back as much of the control of often what is a very drawn out process as we possibly can. And then finally, and we do not forget this, and it's an important element, is that we're involved in trying to help the healthcare support. We try and link them in with the general practitioner if we can. We, have, we talk about doctor's health advisory. They have a peer doctor, um, a medical advisor, like what I was doing in my earlier role. We encourage them to talk to family and peers. I can tell you many, many times that I've sat in front of a doctor who's come in to see us about a claim or a complaint and hasn't told anybody. And occasionally, from our position, not from my clinical role, but I felt the need to actually do direct referrals to a psychiatrist for somebody who's actively suicidal in the middle of a claim. But finally, I think the other element that we are more and more getting involved in is the advocacy role. And this element about the impact of complaints and claims is what we are taking to the regulators to the other regulatory bodies such as the PSR and Medicare that is framing the way we try and actually do some system change alongside with the AMA in a lot of these areas. And it's already been touched on, but one of the areas that's been fraught and going on for many years and is disappointing where it's currently landed, and I say currently landed, is the mandatory reporting provisions and I'll just be really, can I have two minutes just to walk through this? Thanks, Mikesh. Just to remind us why this came into being, because I think it does provide a bit of a framework. There was, I think, a perceived failure of self-regulation, not by us, but by the regulators. An increasing awareness by patients of patient safety issues and very much also political response as to why this came on came into being and we've all heard and we all feel it and we all see it that it is a barrier to seeking help. There's definitely a huge misunderstanding of the law and what that means and there are perceptions not borne out actually by the data of widespread misuse. 
It's just to remind us of those obligations, and I'm going to read this. A health practitioner in the course of practicing their profession forms a reasonable belief that another health practitioner has behaved in a way that constitutes notifiable conduct and for a student th that may place the public at risk, at substantial risk of harm. And that uncovers areas of sexual misconduct, impairment, practicing while intoxicated and substandard practice. As you know, following a lot of publicity and a lot of work from this organisation and many other organisations, including our own, we were desperately trying to change and take and adopt the Western Australian exemption for the treating practitioner. And this led to, this re to the review and the adoption, unfortunately, of a very watered down version of our, our requests and our push to get the WA exemption that has now come into, into, into legislation and will come into, action, into practice at the end of this year following what we are told by APRA and the Medical Board, and certainly we will be a part of, and I'm sure the AMA is trying to educate people about what these changes, albeit small but relatively significant, mean just to try and reduce that barrier to seeking help. So just briefly, what has and hasn't changed? Unfortunately, only that Western Australia retains the treating doctor exemption, and for treating doctors, the key issues are that have changed. There is a slightly higher reporting threshold, although you probably need to be a lawyer to understand the nuance of it, but essentially it's about a substantial risk of harm is the new threshold. They do talk about having a more holistic approach to assessing risk which means that often there's an overlap between the intoxication or the, um, the drug use and impairment, and they, these things are to be considered together. It's quite specific about the additional factors that a treating doctor needs to take into account, and unfortunately or fortunately, there's a broader test for reporting sexual misconduct. So the final, this sentence, I think expresses really the slight shift in the change to the legislation that we need to try and get the message out to our colleagues because we really want to remove that barrier. Ultimately, we would like the WA treating ex practitioner exemption. So this statement, only serious conditions that are not appropriately managed through treatment mitigation strategies need to be reported because they place the public at substantial risk of harm. And if that's a takeout about mandatory reporting, please take that away and we will work to get the treating doctor exemption. Thank you, Mikesh. Now, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, this is all in your hands. Um, as you, if you want to say something, make a statement, uh, maybe ask a question, the microphones are towards the back of the room. Um, before we go there, I'm going to ask for a couple of questions from, as I mentioned earlier, um, Michaela uh, Abbott is here, uh, been identified by Michael, um, and we're very grateful for both her and Jessica, uh, the sisters, to, to be here. Uh, when Chloe uh, took her life, uh, it was uh, really close to the heart for this organisation, as you know, um, and a lot of the action that we're seeing is, has been driven by that. But this family, as uh, Michael has said, has actually changed the language, has changed the dial, I've said, has dialed it up, because we're no, 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 we are now talking about it. And I was ordered to provide the, um, uh, the, the opportunity to provide them with the uh, Pride of Australia a couple of years ago with their mother, uh, in the presence of the New South Wales Premier at the time. So, um, Chloe, uh, sorry, um, uh, Michaela, uh, obviously, um, Jessica, the loss of Chloe is a major issue and has driven you. You've heard a lot of things today. What's your reflection and what's been said, do you feel, uh, in a bit of, just, just, just in a second, I'll bring straight on to don't but bring it on. So we're just going to the front, mic six. Um, uh, your thoughts about what you've heard and where things have been moving to with your advocacy. Yeah, go ahead. It'll come up. Okay. Um, thank you so much, firstly, for having us here. We're really grateful and really humbled, I think, to be here. Um, I have just been sitting listening to this just in awe um, of everyone's 
absolute commitment and dedication to this issue, which is so close to our hearts. Um, there was a few, a few things, but in particular um, from Penny's speech just now. Um, when our sister was unwell and she was um, in a psychiatric facility, up until the day before um, my sister took her life, we actually didn't know why she was in that facility. We didn't know what the, um, what the investigation surrounding her was. And that really resonated me with me, Penny, when you said that, that a lot of the time they don't actually disclose what has happened. And I think it's just such an isolating, such an isolating factor. And still to this day, it like makes me really sad thinking that my sister was in, our sister was in so much pain and struggling so much, but still didn't feel like she was able to tell even us as her family. So I think that's so spot on, that statement that you made. Thanks, Michaela. And Je Jessica, your quick word. Just, we're, just we're quickly, here. I think, uh, I just want to thank the AMA for all the work that they are doing, um, all the speakers, like Michaela said, I'm so in awe of the work you are doing. Um, please, anyone in this room, you guys on the stage as well, if there is anything further that you think that we can be doing to support this cause, we remain committed um, as, as Chloe's family members, um, as advocates. Um, we know that we can achieve a lot in this space. Please don't hesitate to call on us. We are, we are here to stand by your side and we, we continue to thank you for all the work that you do. Thank you, thank Mikesh. You. We'll go to mic one, Omar, and then we'll come back to the front here. Thank you very much, Mikesh. A fantastic uh, session, so thank you uh, to all the speakers. Uh, my name is Omar Korshad. I'm the president in uh, WA, uh, AMA, but I'm speaking here with my orthopaedic hat on as the orthopaedic rep at Federal Council. Um, in my spare time, I run the orthopaedic training program. I've got a question mainly for, for Jessica, I think. Uh, it's about structure. The reality is in, in the orthopaedic uh, world with our trainees, we are facing um, issues with bullying and harassment, poor rostering, uh, and bad treatment of junior doctors right across the country. And we've, we're currently trying to intervene as a college in New South Wales, Queensland, Victoria, South Australia, and Western Australia right now. And uh, we saw the, the horrific story from, from Yumiko Kodota earlier. My question really is how do we get the employers? to actually provide a safe workplace for doctors because in my view, although with, with this fantastic profession, we still have a right to a safe workplace. And as a college, we don't have the, the laws, we don't have the power to deal with these issues. But in every one of the cases we've investigated, the hospital has known about it, especially with the bullying harassment, and they've done nothing. So how do we get them to treat doctors like real people? To, to, to pile them, we'll, we'll come and answer these in, in, in the wrap, but thank you very much for the question. Um, whilst we're coming to Vicky Dawes, who's the Victorian, uh, uh, sorry, I'm always in Victoria, the Queensland Health, the Doctors' Health Program, um, to make some comments, I wouldn't mind if you put the slide at the beginning of the session up with the, the potential motion, we want to take this, please. Thank you, Vicky. Okay. Just, it'll come, it'll come to you. Just keep talking. Thanks, thanks, Mikesh, and thank you to um, all the panel. I just, I'd echo um, what the Abbott sisters were saying, and this is really sort of bang on, and, and I think it's actually a really exciting time to be involved in Doctors' Health, because there's a real push towards, you know, moving beyond that idea that this is somehow um, an individual responsibility. We've moved past that, you know, victim blaming you don't have enough resilience, and we're really starting to look at the systemic issues um, and certainly this is not just a problem within Australia you know this is this is a worldwide problem within the medical profession um, you know we've got we've got um, our, our medical director is currently in Oslo at the European um, Physician Health Conference talking about this very issue um, it's the same in the UK it's the same in Canada in the US um, this is a problem that that in order to move forwards from, we need to work collaboratively so that we're not reinventing the wheel. Um, and I think it's really exciting that, that this is the, the, the way that we're clearly heading. Um, I think the one thing that I'd take away from what all of you have said is, is you know, really one thing that we can take away as, as individuals, because we can feel really um, sort of 
powerless to do anything, um, is, is really bringing it back to that human factor. And, and you know, I know as myself, as somebody who takes calls to um, the Doctors' Health Advisory Service in Queensland, um, as, as a lot of you were saying, often this is the first time that anybody has spoken to someone about the problems that they're facing. And I think we can all play a part in, in sort of humanizing and connecting and acknowledging that we all have vulnerabilities. There's not a person on the planet that doesn't have vulnerabilities that needs um, support. And I think that's where we can all um, play our small part in this. So thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, Vicky. Can we go to number two, uh, Mike two over there? Um, and then I'm going to come to Tessa and Vinay. And I see Leon Edelman. You want to say something? Okay, great. So we might then need to think about our time because I've blown the time as usual. Please. Thank you. My name is Dr. Andrew Jeremichenko. I'm an occupational environmental physician. My specialty is about making workplaces safe. Um, it's about returning people to work who have had an illness. And I can't get a job in Australia. I'm actually taking a job in Qatar because hospitals and health services and health departments don't employ us anymore. Um, I'd like a comment from Dr. Myers about how you've worked with occupational physicians in the States, because I know in the, in the States there's a lot of occupational physicians, they, they work with hospitals everywhere across the States, but here we don't. Uh, and I'd like a comment from the Australian doctors and, and people in the field, how you're working with occupational physicians, if you are at all, because my impression is we're being cut out of this. And doctors' health is where occupational and environmental physicians, we don't just look at chemical environments, we look at social environments as well but we're not being involved in this field. And the health departments have really put us out to medical legal report writing, and that's all we're doing. That's a very important point, and thank you for raising that. Um, what I'm going to do is, when we finish, I'm going to ask them to address some of these things in their closing remarks. Obviously, we're not going to get through all the questions, but I actually want to hear the questions and the comments. Tessa, please. Down the front. I, just, I think that was an incredibly important point. Um, I suppose I come at this from a doctor in training perspective as the current chair of that council. Um, and we've continued to lose colleagues to suicide. And every loss seems, I think, um, not only to be a profound um, emotional um, experience for anybody who's known um, the doctors that die in that, in that way, but it induces this sense of failure that we're failing to make progress in this area. And I think that makes it hard sometimes to continue with the efforts um, that are so important. And I think also that it, it, it sort of, it, because it's so tragic and because it's so compelling, um, I think that's where we focus all our efforts, when actually we need to step back a bit and say, this is the tip of the iceberg. This is the most extreme, awful consequence. But there was so much that happened in the lead up in every one of those cases. And there's so much that's happening for so many others who don't end up dying by suicide, whether they've gotten close, whether you know they've managed to get off um, that track. And that's where I just think, in terms of being able to, to measure some more wins and measure our progress, which is so important to help maintain our momentum um, and our advocacy, that that's where we need to start. We need to start with addressing the way that we work to make simple measures such as safe rosters, reducing burnout, etc., so that we have safe working environments um, and change the way in which we work. The second part is that we have to address the culture in which we work, and I think Omar's point about um, you know, how do we get sort of the hospitals to take responsibility as much as the colleges for um, creating these safe work environments comes down to uh, you know, culture as, as well as um, you know, practical things. Um, but ultimately, I think that we need to really look at prioritising all the things in a holistic sense that permit resilience. All of us are incredibly resilient. We wouldn't have got through medical school if we weren't. But when you don't get to see your family, when you don't get to eat, sleep, exercise, repeat, you know, you, you stand no chance. You're set up to fail. So a lot of those really simple systemic things, I think, are a good place to start, um, are easy to measure in terms of progress towards change. Um, and I think if we can, st you know, start there, um, hopefully that's where this framework is going to allow us to, to really start chalking up some wins. Great, Tessa, thank you. Uh, Dr. Edelman, the president of the World Medical Association, and then I'll come across to here, and then Vinnie. And I know that we then need to round up. I'm sorry, folks, I know there's a lot you want to say. I'll, I'll see what we can do. Let's, let's keep going. Um, Dr. Edelman, thank you. Professor thank Edelman, you. I beg your pardon. Thank you, Murush. Uh, first of all, congratulations. Uh, this issue is very important. It's a worldwide problem, uh, epidemic situation. 
and the presentations were great. However, uh, my problem is that uh, everything that was said about the measures, about the means and the interventions that should be taken, everything is based on uh, good reasoning, on logic, and nothing has been checked. We don't have robust scientific data. What intervention can help? What is number needed to treat for every intervention? And uh, in this, uh, I believe that we are still in the middle age of uh, this issue. And uh, we know about prevalence. Prevalence has been studied uh, very good in many countries. We know that medical students are prone to be mentally ill. I know more than other students. We know that uh, doctors in training are suffering of burnout, very high prevalence. But what should be done? Any intervention, what is a robust scientific data? It's everything is logical and nothing has been checked in uh, evidence-based medicine. That's the problem, that's the challenge, and thank you very much for talking about it. Thank you. Um, before I go to Vinny Lacro, who's the president-elect of the College of Psychiatrists, I'm gonna look at the president and beg for five more minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Vinny. Uh, thank you, Mukesh. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, our college and a lot of our colleagues, like Helen, are actively involved in this space. So a lot of doctors see our colleagues without anyone knowing about it, because most of them seek help confidentially. As Helen said, uh, they don't want to be identified on PBS, they don't want to be identified on uh, Medicare, uh, and so a lot of our colleagues are involved, involved in that space. In terms of uh, the Geneva Declaration, it's quite interesting that uh, uh, looking after oneself is actually the lower end of it because I believe that you cannot achieve any of those other statements if you are not well enough. So I think it needs to be higher up. If we really want to give a, an emphasis to doctors' health and well-being, then it needs to be higher, higher up. Um, I think somebody made a comment about what colleges can do. Colleges can actually be very powerful. At College of Psychiatry, we've done a lot of work, both for trainees as well as for specialist IMGs through the accreditation process. It's a very powerful process uh, for the colleges to make sure that the employers do what they're expected to do. And lastly, uh, there are two elements of it. Uh, one is well-being, and we know a lot of things need to be done about well-being. And the second thing is, is mental illness. So once you've got an illness, you need to access, provide access to people and needs to be treated effectively. Without effective treatment, we are not gonna be able to, to achieve the outcomes we want. And lastly, our college has recently established a foundation which supports research. So if you go to our website, ranzcp.org, and you search for foundation, you can donate to the foundation and you can also apply to the foundation for a research project which will help mental health, and that could be about doctors' mental health as well. Thank you very much. All right, um, I'm going to ask the panelists to um, think about how they want to round up some of those comments. They're very pertinent comments. There's very uh, new thoughts, like the occupational health one. I would not really thought they were excluded. They shouldn't be. Um, and, and, and then the, the how. And I'm guessing some of the how will be back in the hands of the president, the vice president, to, to think about as well. Um, so, Mike, two, please. Thanks. Um, I think everybody ought in this room ought to know we're saving a life right now. And it's been very wonderful to hear this. Um, my name is Sandra Hiro Watari. I am the chair of the council of the AMA, uh, AMA Council of Rural Doctors. Um, I have recently heard a quote that wounded healers wound. And an, a medical student recently said that who was also a soldier in Afghanistan said that it was easier for her to be under sniper fire than to be in medical school. I'd like to ask the panel, um, what can we do 
to um, change some of this collegial lack of support. Okay, I think I might take the opportunity then to turn to the panel um, and start with Michael. Um, you've heard some thoughts and some comments from the floor, uh, from, from, from the, the audience. Could you uh, maybe, could, yeah, thank you. Was there a question about collegial lack of yes. support? You, you've got a mic on your lapel, you don't need to stand up. If you, oh, if you, you, okay. if you, no, you can you do whatever you yeah. like. Okay, so, um, I'm just going to address a couple of these. There's so many, and then others, you know, hopefully, will address the others. Uh, Sandra, I think I'll respond to yours first. Um, when we see this, what I guess you're referring to as a collegial lack of support, um, I think we need to look at the factors, too, that drive individuals, first of all, to study medicine and then compete to get into medicine. Now, I know that your system is different here than it is uh, in North America where you have to have a degree before you then go to medical school. But the process, I'm sure, is similar in that it's, it's very, very competitive. Here. And you, then you're supposed to basically drop that competitiveness once you get in that it's no longer necessary. But of course, that's not the case. And also, when a culture of medicine sometimes pits one student against another, there's a one-upmanship, and residents sometimes feel this, that it's some attendings will play medical students off against residents and things like this. When I talk with individuals like that, and that happens to me in a couple of ways, the, where I work today, the dean appointed me as ombudsperson for the medical students, so I investigate all of the complaints that medical students uh, issue about abusive teaching. And so the perpetrators tend to be either senior medical students or residents or faculty. Um, at the end of the day, what I find so often is for some of the individuals who are the perpetrators, they're sort of defensive. First of all, they're defensive that they've been complained about. And so I have to be very delicate in investigating these complaints. But so often they do raise that old saw, well, this is the way I was trained. And we're trying to get rid of that. And, and so they can still be charged with a lack of professionalism. And then when workshops are offered that really help individuals with a different way of teaching, like I believe that we have to eliminate shaming from teaching. And yet there's still too much of that going on uh, across, the, across the board in all disciplines in medicine. Because there are other ways of effective teaching, but sometimes those shaming professors don't know that. So I think really that has to be, that's kind of an educational um, issue really for them. And so that's really what I wanted to say. And let me, you know, pass this on to some Thank of the Thank you. Others. Jeff? You want me to start Yeah, off? and you know, just to, you've heard some comments, feedback back to our panel. Any thoughts uh, about the way further forward? I... Um, I think the way we've got to allow, our th we've got to be honest and allow ourselves to embrace our vulnerability in the system. Certainly, we've got to have the time to seek help and where you can get help, because that's very difficult. Uh, we need a safe place and a confidential place to do it. And we need the support in the systems to do it, because recovery from a mental health condition is a slow progress, but you can recover. So if you get to the stage where I've got, it's six to 12 months, and yep. my return to work um, Thank you. thing was bad. Um, uh, you were asked a specific question, Jessica, around the methodology, and I'm guessing some of that was raised in the report that you were coming towards, and obviously the answers won't be there, the answers in what we've got on the board there, but your thoughts, yeah, please. I'll, I'll try and be brief. Um, to Sandra, I think we need to embrace kindness. I think a culture of kindness is really important and it needs to come from the top down. It's very hard to start from the bottom. In terms of everything Tess has said is totally spot on. We need to be measuring the things we can measure. Um, Dr Edelman, I think I agree with your points that uh, we need to apply the same scientific rigour to the interventions we're doing, but I also to some extent disagree that we have two very large systematic reviews now looking at interventions. The problem is the interventions themselves aren't being effect effectively evaluated. We're doing a lot of stuff in medical schools that we're not evaluating and so we don't know if they work. We need to apply the same rigour to the research and to the, to the care that we deliver. And then lastly to Omar, 
It's really difficult. I think uh, one really important first step is clever rostering, striking the balance between safe and fatigue preventing rostering is challenging. I think it can be effective when it's taken back by the department and potentially moved away from workforce where we're trying to best optimise service provision and training requirements whilst mitigating fatigue, which isn't necessarily decreasing hours. Um, it's about being clever with the hours that we're rostering. Uh, I think we need to make our agreements, our enterprise agreements, more robust. There are some states that haven't renegotiated their agreements in years. They need to be strong and we need to be accessing them. The AMA, ASMOF, we need to be enforcing them and we need to ensure compliance. And if we do that, then maybe we'll have adequate staff for sick leave and we'll have you know, leave access, flexible rostering and all those things will be very effective. Yeah. It defies belief that many more people coming through, and we actually we should be using those more. That means what the president talked about about money, Helen. And I know the time is there. I'm getting the, the, the mobs here, trying to move me on. Come on, quick, quick. Uh, all I want to say, uh, the, the topic of bullying and harassment is absolutely huge, and I suppose I'm coming to it now as uh, looking after the people that have been bullied and harassed. Sadly, to the point that some I have to do careers advice about what to do now that they can't be doctors anymore and they've made that decision because it's just much easier now to walk away. And these are senior members of our medical profession that have spent almost 20 years getting to where they are now, which is an absolute disgrace for the profession. It is so sad. But I think we're going to have this problem with bullying and harassment until the bullies are untouchable, until they, sorry, until they stop being untouchable. At the moment, we have keepings off all the time. Who owns the bullies? Is it the colleges or is it the workplace? Because once we actually identify that, there are already effective systems in place to manage them under Fair Work Australia, under our EBAs, etc. The issue is that these people hide behind lots of different hats and nobody really knows which way to tackle them. I just wanted to say, in relation to the bullying and harassment and the unprofessional behaviours, actually I think when this is going to stop is when we actually call it a patient safety issue. This is a patient safety issue. Our preliminary data that's looking at our complaints and claims shows it's a significant part of most of the complaints and claims that we, we encounter. So I think we need to flip it around and make this a patient and safety quality and safety issue. Okay, brilliant. I'm really sorry for the people on the microphones. We could have gone on for quite some time, and I, I do apologise for going ahead uh, uh, over time. We won't get to the motion. I'll leave that in your hands to how you want to deal with it. It can just be there for advice, but that's, that's where we should be thinking about going. Thank you to Jeff, Jess, Helen, Penny, and Michael. And here's some gifts for your participation. Thank you very much. We can come off the chase. We need to get off. Come off, 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 off.